Hello, hello. Hi, Rabbi. I see Marilyn. Bonnie, I don't see you. I just see your name. Well, hold on here. I'm, I'm not hearing anybody. Oh, there I am. I see you. There we go. Now I got everyone. Okay. How are you doing? Good. How about you? I'm doing well. Thank you. So you're surviving uh, having the kids all at home and everything? That's a good word for it, surviving. <laughs> well, the one thing I heard was that parents were really going to appreciate teachers after this. Uh, if they didn't already. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just, it, it's a really bizarre thing. But you know what? I, as I've said, it's like, it's crazy. It's a transition, but we're working through it. You know, like, things could certainly be worse. Uh, it's just very crazy. It's very different, and we're all just figuring it out together one day at a time. How are you doing, Sandy? Well, I thought I had it. Now I you lost it. That long hallway. Hmm? Where does that long hallway take you to? Oh, well, you know, well, you have to sort of guess the movie. Oh, it's a movie? Yeah. Uh, not the one with Jack Nicholson. Indeed, Here. the one with Jack. You got it. Look at that. The name of it. The Shining. Thank you. Yeah. You it's, it's from the hotel, The Shining. Hi, yeah. Jan. Uh, you can hear me? I am. I hear you, but I can't find you again. I lost you. Bonnie, you look like you're upside down. Sure. Well, I, I can't find you even. Bonnie. Oh. Yes. Hi. I'm not there. Oh, Bernie and Marilyn, wow. No. Yeah, I see Bernie and Marilyn. I see Melissa. But I, I can't get in right. I did something wrong. I hear you, but I don't see you. You seem to be frozen, Bonnie, but you might have to, to go out and go back in. Okay, let's try again. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> let's see. Let's try again. Okay, how do I get out? Bonnie, isn't there something that says leave meeting? At the very bottom, it says leave meeting, Bonnie. I don't even see the meeting. Wait a minute. Okay, I'm closing it and I'm trying again. Let's try again. Bill. Hello. Oh, can you hear me? Just, can anybody hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Oh, my, I was doing a guitar lesson with my son, with my grandson last night, and he did June join Zoom Plus. He got rid of my oh, Debbie Spiegel for some reason. Yeah, I, I, I have you there. Isaac, put, Isaac put join Zoom last night. Uh, it shouldn't say join Zoom. It should say Debbie Spiegel. Oh, now it says. Yeah, I changed your name for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What's it doesn't make any difference. Here, have fun. What's this? I don't know. Hi, Linda. And I see Linda coming in. Rabbi, could we put Debbie Siegel, S E G A L? My grandson did something. I don't know what he did. Well, I mean, that, that, okay. This is a temporary fix uh, on, on my end. You know, you'll have to do something later for your, your thing. E L or A L, the end. Who are you talking to me? Okay. Hey, hey, Debbie, spell okay, your last name. You got it, Bonnie. You got it. Hey, Marilyn, you want to see my I toes? Do <laughs> 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 Please. Oh, S E G A L. Rabbi, S E. There's no I. Okay. Rabbi, there's no I. Hi. Okay. Hi, Sandy. Hi, guys. How is everybody? Oh, thank you, everybody. It's, it's there now. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Stewie, Maureen punched you in the head. I see Bernie and Marilyn, and I see Maureen and Stan. Oh, they can't hear us. Hi, Debbie. Oh, Hi, Debbie. in the background. Oh, my God, Tony's there. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Hi. Hi, Hi Tony. Hi, Is Melissa. Anybody ser is anybody serving coffee and cake? No. I Not for me. I got we just had dinner. <laughs> it, it's dessert time. <laughs> I'm ready for that. <laughs> it's wine time. I got I got a little wine left. <laughs> Cheers. I'm not gray anymore. 
Yeah, don't look at Maureen. She's got, she's gorgeous. She cheated. She cheated. I didn't cheat. I just. <laughs> she just got lucky. <laughs> okay, you, Rabbi. Right? Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. I'm glad we're all together. I mean, that's really what I'm missing the most, honestly, is just these nice moments of community interaction sort of being together. So it's really nice that we have all made it here uh, to, to study, you know, but also just to, again, you know, enjoy a little community. I think that's really important and really a great thing uh, that we're all able to come together. Uh, so welcome uh, everybody. Tonight. Oh God, I lost you again. Uh, and I lost you all again. <laughs> oh God. I don't know. Who's that? Is it Bob? Lost. There Get we froze. go. All right, I'm not touching anything. <laughs> Rabbi, okay. how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Thank you for asking. I'm doing and family, a, all good? Family is all good. Uh, just doing our thing, uh, homeschooling and keeping everyone sane. You don't have that cute background you had last week. No, this is a different background. Oh, I like last week's background. I'm switching it up. <laughs> uh, you know, this is a, some more movie trivia that we were mentioning earlier. So... You have, to, you have to name that film. Oh, God. Know, name that film? Where is that? The, the correct answer is The Shining. I was going to say, it's, I, I knew that. All that. work and no play makes the rabbi a dull boy. I never saw it. Yes. Oh, Stephen King. That was his best book. I don't do scary. I don't sleep. Oh, and it's, it, it's so apropos for this. Indeed. There we go. Now we're getting somewhere. So, okay, let's join in. So our prophet this week, uh, prophet du jour, uh, is Micah. Uh, so he's next on the list of the 12 minor prophets. Very well known for um, one of his most famous quotes, uh, that uh, what does God require of you uh, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. You'll see that quote uh, often in, uh, on synagogue walls and literature. That's his most uh, well-known quote, though he has a few others, as we'll see today, uh, that uh, are pretty well-known, pretty common, even one that has made it to our uh, liturgy. Uh, it's recited during the Torah service, and so when we come to it, we'll see if we can uh, pick it out. Uh, Micah is active during the late 8th century, uh, so he's one of the earliest of the 12 minor prophets. He's a contemporary, most likely, of uh, Hosea, of Amos. <laughs> Uh, at least from a historical standpoint, uh, Jonah and Micah overlap, uh, according to when there, there are their prophecies, when the prophetic missions were to have taken place. Um, we have some historical allusions to Assyria in the book, uh, but what makes it interesting is that you have other parts of the book that reference later uh, things in Jewish history, uh, probably... Um, about the Babylonian exile, about even the post Islamic period, which would probably make us uh, believe that this book is a compilation, right? And so there are some parts of it that might be older, dating to, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh centuries, and, and some being even uh, being later. So we have uh, about it. Oh, Leah just came in. Hi, Leah. Hi. I'm not getting anything on the screen except, oh, I am, except for Zoom. I see you. I see all the pictures, but I only see Zoom on the. Okay, we used to do a little muting here and there so, so we can get through a little text today. Uh, so Micah uh, is from a town southwest of Jerusalem. Uh, he has a very populist uh, message. He has a disdain for corruption and for tension. Uh, he championed a lot of the early sort of traditions of Israel, and he uh, condemned, as many prophets did, uh, religious practice that is untethered from the ethical, uh, from ethical performance. And so that's going to be a common trope we see in the prophets, that they wonder about the idea of you know, going to temple, doing the sacrifices, you know, doing prayer, but then uh, not upholding uh, ethical traditions that are found uh, in the Torah, not doing the mitzvot. Uh, uh, of Tikkun Olam and working with other people and to create a better world. Um, so there's going to be that disconnect that the prophets don't, that don't like, don't appreciate. Um, and so it's going to be, I think, an interesting read because it has that mix of historical events 
and uh, you know the, the the typical prophetic yearnings uh, and speeches. One of the things that sets Micah apart in a way is that more than others, he was a little bit more aggressive, perhaps a little bit more pronounced in his uh, condemnation, uh, especially when it came to uh, comparing the, the city of Jerusalem to like a place of idolatry. Uh, and that's pretty harsh uh, words, as one can imagine, didn't go over very well, didn't make him the most popular kid at the party, uh, as we knew the prophets very uh, rarely were. Uh, but his words are actually quoted again in Jeremiah. And so we have a sense that he was obviously before and this part of the book was written uh, early enough and well-known enough to be quoted, uh, to be cited in a different prophetic book. Um, so the way the book breaks down is that it's about, I think it's seven chapters, memory serves. Yes, yeah, seven chapters. Uh, the first three are oracles of judgment, pronouncements of judgment against the people. Four and five transition into hope uh, and about uh, hope for the future, a messianic aid. Uh, and six and seven, Sort of vacillate between the two. Uh, Leah, you raising your hand there? No, I'm trying to get rid of that little icon. I have no idea. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen, and so we can get the uh, the words here in front of us. Uh, we'll say the blessing for the study of Torah. Baruch Ata Adonai uh, share. Well, hello there. Okay, so now that we've said our prayer, we're going to see it pop up in a second. Uh oh, uh, there we are. Yeah. Oh, now it's there. I'm not going to see the screen. What did you do? What did you, what did you just do that you got it? Can you please shut the door so? What is Hello. Hello. Okay. We're going to begin here with 1-1. One, one. It's no, no better place to begin than the beginning. Uh, Marilyn, would you like to give that a read? Sure. The word of the Eternal that came to Micah, the Morishite, who prophesied concerning Samaria and Jerusalem and the reigns of King Jotham, Ahaz, and Ezekiel of Judah. Listen, all you people, give heed, O earth, and all it holds, and let my eternal God be your accuser, my eternal from his holy abode. For lo, the eternal is coming forth from God's dwelling place. God will come down and stride upon the heights of the earth. The mountains shall melt upon under God, and the valleys burst open like wax before fire, like water cascading down a slope. Okay, that's a good start. And so you see here we get the historical context that he uh, preaches during these reigns. Samaria is used alternatively, you know, with the northern kingdom of Israel. And so we're getting a sense he's talking about the north, right? Samaria and with Judah, you know, being the lower uh, kingdom. So, and you have these three kings, two out of three uh, were terrible uh, in the eyes of the prophets, uh, Jotham and Ahaz were both uh, known to be pretty terrible uh, in, their, uh, in their rule. Uh, they are accused of helping to spread idolatry and corruption and all the other unpleasant stuff associated uh, in, the prof in the prophetic mind with sin and transgression. Hezekiah is a good dude. Hezekiah gets a lot of positive, uh, you know, positive talk uh, in the Bible uh, about how great he was as a king and how he tried to uh, you know, do what was right in God's eyes. And so there are a few kings uh, in the, um, the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles, there are a few kings that get more praise, that garner more adulation uh, from the biblical authors than Hezekiah. Uh, and he's also the one that has Hezekiah's tunnel, uh, which is... So, uh, okay. So with, that is our introduction. That's when he uh, prophesies. Then we have over here, the beginning, we talked before about the idea of the legal language that prophets sometimes use. And so here, let my eternal God be your accuser. Okay, so God is going to be a prosecuting attorney. God is going to be a case uh, before yeah. the Israelites uh, and he's going to use the prophet as his mouthpiece 
to make this case against the people. Uh, and so that's what we see here. God's coming, right? God's coming forth from God's dwelling place, wherever that might be, from the heaven, uh, whether it's from the temple, however they're going to think about it. But the greater point is that God's coming, and it's not going to be a good day. You know, we talked about this with Amos, uh, and um, and with Joel, you know, this idea that there's a longing, right, that people have for God's presence. They want God to be with them. We talk about that today, right? We want God to be with us. We want to have God by our side. We want God, you know, that, that connection, that feeling that God's presence is with us. The biggest um, source of despair in the Torah that we find in Exodus uh, is when the Israelites, after the sin of the golden calf, their greatest punishment, once they weren't going to all get killed for, you know, building the golden calf, was that God's presence was not going to be with them anymore. They were going to be on their own uh, in the wilderness, uh, maybe have an angel uh, lead them, but not God. And Moses pleads with God and says, no, please, you have to yourself be the one to lead us. Your presence has to be among us. So they build the Mishkan, the portable tabernacle, and God's presence dwells within that tabernacle as a sign of God being with them. So, you know, here, it's the, it's the, unfortunately, because God is angry, it's not a great thing that God's going to be with them. God's going to be with them, you know, with a baseball bat, you know, ready to start hitting people over the head with it who aren't behaving well. God's going to come in and God's going to basically melt the world, right? And things are going to explode uh, when God comes. So it's not the most positive imagery because God is not happy. God is less than amused. And so that's What's he, what is he mad about this time, Rabbi? Same as always. <laughs> same as, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that's what it is. That's the prophet. The same as it's, uh, the Israelites not performing mitzvot. You know, the Israelites being terrible. Uh, to each other and being idolatrous. And so that's the thing we're going to get when it comes to the prophets. For Micah in particular, it's going to be more about the ethical um, backsliding than it is the ritual. Um, Micah, unlike Ezekiel uh, and unlike um, a couple other prophets, seems to be really not concerned overly with uh, the ritual side of things. Um, he, he feels the biggest transgression is not uh, about ritual uh, lapsing, nor does he have any great desire for people uh, to engage in more sort of ritual. His biggest issue seems to be uh, that there's a, that ethical lapse, uh, that, that the people are really not treating each other well. It's the sins of humans against humans, as opposed to sins uh, against God that Micah really emphasized. So, so that, that's why God is angry, is because of how the people are treating each other. Rabbi, what time is this compared to when the children of Israel went into the desert? So, you know, so the Israelites, you know, let's say are wandering in the wilderness in around 15, 1400 BCE. Uh, and this uh, would look like it's around 725, 700 uh, BCE. So a big jump, you know, so the Israelites are wandering. Then they had the uh, you know the time in between uh, where like Joshua and the judges you know when they had that period of time. Then you get King David around 1000 uh, BCE. Uh, so the, the Davidic rule, Solomon's around 970 960, uh, and then you know by the mid 10th century the kingdoms have already split. Uh, and so like the Israelite. United Kingdom lasts not even 50 years before they fight with each other. You know, all those Jews always arguing with each other, can't figure it out. So they wind up dividing the kingdom pretty quick uh, after Solomon uh, because Solomon didn't make a lot of friends uh, towards the end of his rule. Solomon was known for, um, what's a polite way to say slavery, a forced conscription of Israelites uh, into the temple service to build. Uh, and he had about 700 wives too. And that didn't make him very popular. Uh, so these were foreign, you know, foreign wives and concubines. So he wound up, his approval rating went downhill pretty quick, is what I'm trying to say. And so then there was a debate about who's going to succeed him, whether it was going to be his son or Rehoboam, or whether it's going to be somebody else. Some people were sick uh, and tired of Solomon, didn't want his dopey son ruling. 
uh, and they wanted someone else. And so that's where it split, was with the question of succession, who comes after Solomon. And so Judah, the southern kingdom, only had Davidic kings. It's all the line of David. You know, so it's David, Solomon, Solomon's son, et cetera. The northern kingdom appointed some other dude uh, to rule, and it didn't end well. So, uh, and so that, that's basically the, the history of it. And so he, um, Micah, is speaking around the time uh, of some of these Israelite kings that weren't very popular, and one of the Judah kings that was very popular, Hezekiah. So that's sort of our, our, our history here, our, our, our time our timeline. Um, we have here, now he's going to continue, because uh, this is again our oracle of doom and of, uh, of, of anger. Uh, Melissa, you want to give that a read over here? Sure. All this. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob but Samariah and what the shrines of Judah but Jerusalem? So I will turn Samariah into a ruin and open country into ground for planting vineyards, for I will tumble her stones into the valley and lay her foundations bare. So some of this material here is, um, is pretty common with Samaria in particular, right? So the idea is that because they're so bad, because they're doing the wrong thing, God's going to let it be raised. It's going to let it be brought low. Uh, and because of what they did, you know, the whole, the whole place gets to get it. They get, they get to, to uh, feel the wrath here. Um, and this idea of the shrines, right? So shrines is a negative word uh, in, in this context. The idea that they're building shrines and altars to other pla in other places. Actually, one of the reasons Hezekiah was so popular is that he destroyed a lot of these shrines. Uh, and so what was the problem with the shrines? They, they were, you know, there were, two, there were two problems. One, the shrines might be to Baal, to, you know, to an Asherah, to, you know, to idols, right? So that, that was a problem. But even if it was a shrine to God, you know, uh, the God of Israel, there's still a problem. You don't build shrines to God. You don't build shrines to God, because who, who doesn't like that? Aside from God, who doesn't like that? The priests. Because the mm. priests keep bringing the stuff to them, right? Because they have to do the sacrifices, and they have to take a little bit of the off the top, right? So they're going to be, you know, eating this stuff. They're going to be getting the money from it as well. So the priests don't want to see all these other things open up. Competition, right? You know, you don't want 25 synagogues in one town. It's not going to work out so. You have to space those out so everyone can play, so to speak. So the, We haven't changed. Yeah, bingo. Yeah, exactly right. It becomes a little bit of an issue, right? Uh, it's still true today. So you want to have you know, a, a centralization, right, of worship if you're the priests and if you're the prophets. You know, you want people to come to Jerusalem and offer, you know, their sacrifices and, and, and make their donations to the temple, you know, as you do. And you don't want it spread out in 25 different places. You want it to be, again, all in one place. Bring people together, you know, create that community. Uh, and so they are not doing that at this point. That's going to be a problem for the prophets, you know, A, because it, it can lead to idolatry or incorrect worship, and it decentralizes things, which at that time was not viewed as positive. They wanted everyone flowing to one place to celebrate together. It sounds like that history repeats itself. Yes. Since 500 years earlier, Moses comes down from the Mount of Sinai, and they're all, they were all putting up idols, yep. and God is so mad. Looks like the same thing. It's a constant struggle. I mean, that's why the commandment against idolatry is repeated so often. Again, it's a sociological uh, insight, perhaps. But the reason you have to mention it so many times is because it's happening. If it wasn't happening, you don't have to mention it, right? You know, so because it's happening so often, you have to repeat it over and over again. Stop doing it. You know, stop worshiping idols. Stop doing these terrible things. Uh, in the service of these idols, uh, and it's just a, a struggle uh, throughout Moses, but I mean, but through the, the Joshua and the, and the prophets, and, you know, it's all the same thing over and over again. Stop worshiping the idols. But they had a very much a a pluralistic, so to speak, uh, to put it in modern terms. But they, you know, they really believed a lot of them at that time that. 
they can pray, they can sacrifice to the God of Israel. But sometimes that line, you know, you might get a busy signal. You know, you might not get through the first time. So, hey, you know, he sacrificed to God on Monday and sacrificed to Baal on Tuesday. And maybe, you know, if God's not answering you, maybe Baal will. Maybe uh, Asherah will, 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 maybe Ra, maybe someone else, maybe he'll get through. And if you're desperate, if you want to pray to something, if you want uh, healing or if you want, you know, good fortune, whatever it might be, you're going to try everything. You know, you're going to select from the, the Chinese food menu of, of gods, you know, I'll take a little bit of column A, Adonai, you know, column B, Baal, column C, Chemosh. You know, I'll, I'll take one of each, you know, and maybe it'll be good. One of them will answer me. God don't like that. You know, that, that doesn't work out well for us, you, you know, for, for that kind of thing. You don't like the, uh, the answer, you go to another one. You go to the other one. Exactly right. It reminds me of, frankly, the ultra Orthodox, because they, they do a lot of that too. You know, you go, you go to your Rebbe, you ask your, your Rebbe the question, you want the answer, you go to another Rebbe. You know, I, I, I once knew a guy who went to like 12 Rebbe's uh, before, to, to get the answer he wanted to get. Uh, and he got it and he was fine. The other 11 didn't count. Uh, but the 12th one who told him yes, when the 11 were saying no, that's the one he went with, was the 12th one. <laughs> you know, so you, you Rebbe shop. Uh, and, and here they were God shopping uh, and just trying to see which one was going to answer their prayer faster. All right. Uh, and it becomes a becomes a problem, and so that's why Samaria is getting nailed here, uh, and uh, and Judah as well for some of that uh, religious issues. But as we'll see, it's the ethical ones that are going to come uh, more to the forefront. Leah, can you see that from there? I can. You want to read a seven and uh, for us? Sure. All her sculptured images shall be smashed, and all her harlot's wealth be burned, and I will make a waste heap of all her idols, for they were amassed from fees for harlotry, and they shall become harlot's fees again. Good times. Because, yeah, yeah, because of this I will lament and wail. I will go stripped and naked. I will lament as sadly as the jackals, as mournfully as the ostriches. They have ostriches? <laughs> <laughs> for her wound is incurable it has reached judah it has spread to the gate of my people to jerusalem indeed so yeah pretty rough stuff um we have this, uh, the idolatry issue here um and this idea that uh, they're getting all this money uh, either literally or metaphorically you know uh, you know with, with the harlot's wealth uh but the idea that they are we talked about, again, the image of the lawyer. We also had the image of the idolatrous, sorry, adulterous uh, wife. You know, the idea that, you know, being with one God can't satisfy her. You know, she has to go around to all the other gods, right, uh, you know, as well. And so that's not a good play. Uh, so Israel is compared often to, you know, a, a harlot. Uh, you know, the idea that they can't be with one person. They got to be with everybody. So... Uh, and so because of that, they're going to get smashed, all right? They're going to be a, a waste heap uh, for the idols, and all the money is going to go back to where it was before. Uh, and then uh, Micah, a little bit of a uh, flourish here. It's going to be very visual for us. Uh, he's going to walk around uh, naked, uh, you know, and lament and wail. Um, and sa sadly as the jackals, as mournfully as the ostriches, I'm not really... Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, think, I think the imagery there is that the uh, the jackals, you know, if they, if they don't have food, maybe they get really sad, and it's like it's yeah. a destruction. The jackals are scavengers. I'm not sure if ostriches yeah. are scavengers in the same way. So I'm not sure what the parallel is uh, for the ostriches. I don't know if they're particularly sad. I've never met a happy or sad ostrich. I feel like <laughs> they've all just seemed hungry when I've met them. Uh, that's about it. Uh, but the idea being is that it, it's an incurable wound. It actually reminds me of elephants, you know, that the, uh, in the Talmud, you know, there's always talk about elephants. And these rabbis never dealt with elephants, really. I mean, like, that wasn't something that they dealt with, but it was hypothetical. Let's talk about elephants, too. Why not? <laughs> I also learned a couple of weeks ago about whether... Oh. Are they... Another bit of animal trivia. Is it giraffe kosher, yes or no? Yes. It's got a hoof. It's got a hoof, doesn't it? 
It is from a physiological perspective. It is technically kosher because it has the right hooves and right. it the cud. However, there is a logistical problem is that it is next to impossible to water a giraffe in a kosher way because in order to do shita, you have to go through the for a giraffe where the neck begins or ends. So it's got a lot of neck. Yeah, so, so because it can't be slaughtered kosher, uh, it, it's technically not, you know, we're, we don't really eat giraffe. Um, right. For a number of reasons, we don't eat giraffe. But, but would, think uh, about the amount of stuffing we can get into that neck. Yeah, I'm telling you, it can make a bit of kishka or something out of it. You know, That's we're right. <laughs> working on it. A little derma would be excellent. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a lot of neck. Oh, God. A lot of neck. Neck. It's like one of those things where like I can never imagine like eating a giraffe, but then again, like the first person who wanted to eat a lot of these like sea models had to be pretty darn hungry uh, when they, when someone decided to eat a lobster for the first time. Like now it's a delicacy would be for a lot of people, whatever it is, but it's like a sea cockroach. You know, it's so, like you had to be like really hungry to break that sucker open and try to figure out, you know, how to get the meat out of it. It was kind of easy to figure out, I think. Sea cockroach You know. <laughs> well, just as an aside, I have pet giraffes and fed them before, and they have velvety lips. They are really, yeah. really cool, but if they turn their head and hit you, um, it's a trip to the hospital. Boy, yeah, no, I've yeah. never fed giraffes. I think at the zoo, they let you feed the giraffes here. Um, in the Tampa, Zoo Tampa, I think they let you feed mm -hmm. the giraffes. Uh, one more thing to put on the list after COVID. <laughs> put it on the list. Okay. Oh, Sandy, you want to give us a read over here? Sandy, you there? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Yeah, you want, you want, to, you want to jump in over here? Ah, those. Ah, those who plan iniquity and design evil on their beds. When morning dawns, they do it, for they have the power. They covet fields, fields and seize them, houses and take them away. They defraud men of their homes and the people of their land. Assuredly, thus said the Eternal, I am planning such a misfortune against this clan that you will not be able to free your necks from it. You will not be able to walk erect. It will be such a time of disaster. Okay, indeed. Uh, a little bit rough once again. Um, when I look at this uh, statement, I think about the idea of power, the, who, who are the powerful and who are the powerless, uh, because that's, I think, what this is speaking to, that those who have power, they can sit there, they can plot, and they can scheme, and then, you know, what they scheme in the evening, they can do in the morning, because no one's there to stop them. Uh, they can do it whatever they want. So if they want your field, they can take your field. If they want your house, uh, and so they have the the power to evict people, basically to um, have you know, make people homeless, basically if they want. And if they don't, they don't. But if they do, they do. They have, they have the power to do that. Uh, and because this is happening. Uh, in the prophet's mind, you know, the idea that this is happening too much or really frankly shouldn't happen at all, but that it is happening uh, during his time, God's not happy, you know, uh, with this. And so God is going to show the people, right, uh, who the powerful one is, you know, who the one in, in control is at this time. And so that's why God is now planning, right? So the people, it's, it's a juxtaposition, right? The people who have the power are planning and plotting in their beds. Well, you know what? God's making a plan too, and that plan's gonna not be uh, so great for these people who are getting uh, backs, uh, and that they won't be able to free themselves from it. And it's gonna be a time of great disaster uh, when it comes. Okay, Tony, you wanna give us a read over here? Sure. In that day, one shall recite a poem about you and utter a bitter lament and shall say, my people's portion changes hands, how it slips away from me, 
Our field is allotted to a rebel. We are utterly ravaged. Truly none of you shall cast a lot cord in the assembly of the eternal. Oh, thank you. But I uh, love this top preaching. Perfect. Yeah, yeah no, it, it's going to get to, to the goodness of say. We have things to do. Um, so yeah, so here we have a poem, you know, here. Uh, and they're going to say, it's like, oh my God, how terrible, you know, it was. This idea of the, the, the lot cord. So what they did back then was that they would demarcate, you know, their fields, you know, with cords. They would you know, put a peg down, tie the cord, and put another peg. And that's where you knew where your land was versus someone else's land. And it was seen move someone else's peg, move someone else's cord over because you'd be stealing their land. Oh, what's a foot here, a foot there, you know, and they would maybe play with it and that would be a problem. And so here they're saying, hey, you know, you don't have to worry about it at all. None of you are going to be putting down any markers. None of you are going to be owning any land once God comes slash the Assyrians come and bust up your, 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 your uh, land and your home and put you into exile, right? So you don't have to worry about this anymore. Uh, when this happens, and as Tony was saying, you know, well, when you're going to hear this bad news, people don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear this bad news. Uh, and so actually, Tony, you want to give me the next, next little part here? Sure. Stop preaching, they preach. That is no way to preach. Shame shall not overtake us. In the house of Jacob's commanded, is the eternal patience short? Is such a God practice? Exactly. So it's like, people don't want to hear this message. They don't want to hear this. This is bad news. People want to hear good news. They want to hear everything's going great. Everything is hunky-dory. It's like the coronavirus. Everyone wants to hear the good news. Yes, please. Yeah, we don't want to hear bad news. We don't want to hear about social distancing for another God knows how many months. We want to get back to the beach. We want to go. We want to have fun. Uh, we, that's what we want to hear. Boo, bad news. Yay, good news. So, <laughs> and that's, you know, look, that's what it is. Uh, and so, but part of their issue here is that because of the uh, vociferousness of Micah's uh, preaching um, and, and how graphic it is, and really, again, because it's also striking against Jerusalem, his words, and they're saying, no, that's ridiculous. You can't say that. You know, we're going to be fine. Because why would God ever do that? Why would God ever strike out against God's chosen people, right? We're, we're the favorite sons and daughters. Why would we ever you know, be in trouble? Yes, for other people. Other people can get smacked around. Other people, you know, can be worthy of punishment. But not us. We'll be fine. We'll, you know, we'll be perfectly fine where we are. God's patience is in short. God's loving and merciful. We can do whatever we want. Why is God going to come in and, and, and make us have a bad time? So that, that's what they're saying, you know, in response. Uh, and then Mike is going to come back. Uh, Bonnie, you there? Yeah, I'm here. You want to read this over here, to be sure? To be sure, my words are friendly to those who walk in rectitude. But an enemy arises against my people. You strip the mantle with the cloak. Off such a pass unsuspecting. Who are turned away from war? You drive the women of my people away from their pleasant homes. You deprive their infants of my glory forever. Yeah, so pretty harsh words. The idea is that, look, if you're uh, good, if you're behaving yourselves, then sure, my words are going to be friendly. You know, I'm going to be good to you if you're doing the right thing. If you're not doing the right thing, you know, if there's this internal... Um, uprising of animosity and lack of ethics, this idea of they, they strip off the cloaks of unsuspecting people, you know, those who are refugees, right, those who are turned away from war, they're coming to these towns and they're getting taken advantage of. That's the, um, in the Talmudic literature, right, that's the grave sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, is that it's, it's being uh, not hospitable. It's actually being, you know, violent against people who are visiting, right? Uh, people who are trying to enter the town, that, that they are taken advantage of, they're robbed, they're beaten. And so that's why God um, turns against Sodom and Gomorrah, so the lack of hospitality and they're being, um, 
you know, violent uh, and um, violent to strangers. You know, that, that's the sin of Sodom, according to the rabbis. Um, and so we have a similar idea here that there, you know, people are coming to their town, they're being taken advantage of, they're being uh, stripped of their possessions. Uh, and that the women, you know, are being driven away. They're being taken advantage of as well. So you have the strangers. It's um, there is that tripartite structure, right? Where you'll see this uh, phrase in different ways uh, in not only the Torah but the prophetic literature is that you have to care for three groups, right? You have to care for the widows. You have to care for the orphans. You have to care for the stranger. Right? Those. those Three, and they're often grouped together uh, like that in the Torah and in the, the prophetic literature. And it doesn't literally mean those three groups. Uh, it's used as a, a euphemism, as an expression to mean everybody who is powerless. Because in that time period, those three groups are the ones that had the least amount of power in society. If you were a widow uh, back in uh, the biblical times, you probably had no property and no way of supporting yourself. If you were an orphan, similar deal. You have to have a lot of trouble uh, making your way uh, in the world. And the stranger, depending on where they were, you know, the stranger could easily be taken advantage of. And so here, Micah is using those three um, groups in a way and, uh, and saying, these are the ones who are being taken advantage of. The stranger, right? You're stripping them of their clothes. You know, the women, you know, you're driving them away. You're driving them out uh, from where they live. And even children, right, you are, are mistreating, you're ill-treating. And so those three uh, groups, because you're mistreating them, is going to be a retribution a common. Uh, and as we'll see here, uh, verses uh, 10 uh, and forward. Uh, Rosewaters, you want to give it a little read? Sure. Up and depart. This is no resting place. Because of your defilement, terrible destruction shall befall. If a man were to go about uttering windy, baseless falsehoods, I'll preach to you in favor of wine and liquor. He would be a preacher acceptable to that people. I will assemble Jacob, all of you. I will bring together the remnant of Israel. I will make them all like sheep of Basra. Like a flock inside its pen, they will be noisy with people. One who makes a breach goes before them. They enlarge it to a gate and leave by it. Their king marches before them, the eternal at their head. Okay. Really fantastic imagery. So basically it's saying in 10, right? Don't stay here. This isn't a good place to lodge anyway. So if you're a stranger and you had your stuff taken away from you, whatever it is, you know what? Good. Get out. Run fast. Because God's coming and it ain't going to be pretty. So, you know, it's going to be not a place to stay. Don't stay overnight. No vacancy. Get out of there. Uh, and then 11, even better, a little bit of a change of tack. If you had a dude who's out there just, you know, making stuff up, right, just, you know, making up uh, falsehoods, lines, whatever it is, and saying, hey, you want a prophecy? I'll take a, a little tequila with it. You know, make me a gin and tonic, and I'll tell you whatever you want. Uh, and then they're going to say, yeah, that's great, sure, you know, because they're going to buy the prophecy that they like. Uh, and so that kind of preacher, Micah, is saying, that's the one that's good enough you know, for these people, the one who prophesy, you give them a bottle of hooch, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be fine as prophets uh, for them. So not really the best way to go about it. Um, so give, me, give me a little wine and I'll give you a prophecy. We'll work for, for booze. Uh, and then here... Uh, you know, God is going to assemble Jacob, uh, you know, the people, and they're going to be like sheep. Not, again, that pleasant imagery, right, that they're also going to be caged together, uh, waiting for uh, the bad times to come. And um, there's going to be a breach made, there's going to be a military uh, assault, and they're going to be just like sheep for the slaughter, uh, you know, in, in the pen. So, again, pretty rough imagery in the sheepfold. Bozra is a town uh, in Edom. Uh, it's actually the um, ancestral home of Esau, uh, is Bozra. You know, Jacob obviously gets Israel, and Esau gets Bozra, gets Edom. That's the capital. Okay, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. 
uh, even though this part, well, we'll read this part because it's so uh, graphic. Okay. Let's see here. Jan, you want to give us a read here? Are you talking to me? Yep, Jan. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I said, listen, you rulers of Jacob, you chiefs of the house of Israel, for you ought to know what is right, but you hate good and love evil. You have devoured my people's flesh. You have flayed the skin off them and their flesh off their bones. After tearing their skins off them and their flesh off their bones, breaking their bones to bits, you can cut it up into a pot like meat oh. in a cauldron. <laughs> That's kind of graphic. <laughs> a yes, little bit too much. Well, <laughs> um, so here, this is not meant to be literal, uh, though there are references to cannibalism in other parts of the prophets. This is not uh, meant to be a literal interpretation. Uh, it's supposed to be more, I think, metaphorical. The idea being that this is about, uh, about um, economics. This is about money more than anything else. That they have basically taken and stripped people of their possessions uh, and so the, the taken, you keep taking, 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 taking from the people. And so you took their cloak, you're taking their skin, you're not content with their skin, you're going to take their, their, their flesh, you're going to you know, deal with their bones too. And that's not good enough either. You're going to, you know, again, sorry that it's graphic, you're going to basically like, like, like suck the marrow out of these people. You know, like, like that's how bad it's getting. You're leaving them with nothing. You're taking everything from them. It's not good enough that you take a little bit, a little more, a little more. You want to take everything from them uh, and, and leave them with literally nothing at that point. You're consuming them entirely. Uh, and so again, not, not literal. It's not the Donner Party. Uh, you know, uh, it's um, metaphorical. One hopes. Okay. After that lovely image. Has, who hasn't read yet that isn't muted? Uh, I haven't. Am I muted? Uh, okay. I'll, I'll read. Oh, please stand. Go ahead. Someday they shall cry out to the eternal, but God will not answer them. At that time, God's face will be hidden from them in accordance with the wrongs they have done. Thus said the eternal to the prophets who led my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to chew but launch a war on, on him who fails to fill their mouths. Okay, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a good place to stop for now, uh, for that part over here. So, you know, so all this bad stuff's happening, right? And they're saying, well, one day these people are going to call out to God and say, God, why aren't you helping me? Well, it's because of all this bad stuff you just did, you know? So you can't be terrible on Monday and then pray to God for help on Tuesday. Uh, it's that similar idea, right? That you can't turn to God when it's convenient, and you can't be uh, religious or pious when it's convenient, and then terrible uh, on other times. There has to be a consistency in one's efforts. So, five, I think, is actually pretty poignant, uh, and I think it also relates to today uh, as well. But the idea that that it's easier to say, "Ah, don't worry about it," you know, if you're in a good situation. If you're in a good situation, you don't have things to worry about. It's easier to say, oh, it's fine. Everything's going to be okay. You know, you know, don't worry about things. It's going to be all right. But if you have nothing, you know, it, it's harder to have that attitude. You know, if you're in a, in, a, in, a, in a worse situation, it's harder. And so you have these prophets who say, oh, things are great. You know, and they're sitting down to their buffet. You know, but the people who don't have that, who don't have that same power or don't have the same uh, means are not doing so well and they're taking advantage of those people even further right so the prophets and the other people are, are, are taking a war on those who are again are helpless who are going hungry they're being stripped of their possessions and their ability to make a living in the world uh and so again it's not great for them you know so it's peace for those who have the power and no peace for those who don't and so it's again it's it's hypocrisy as we see. Uh, Debbie, you there? I'm here. Can you uh, hear me? Yep. You want to read this over here? Yes, I will. Assuredly, it shall be night for you so that you cannot prophesy, and it shall be dark for you so that you cannot divine. The sun shall set on the prophets, and the day shall be darkened for them. 
the seer shall be shamed and the and the diviners confounded they shall cover their upper lips because of, no, because no response comes from god it's an uh, interesting imagery uh and it's actually one of my favorite images in, in this book that the prophets right i'm going to use this metaphor now the prophets they, they see the light, right? They have the divine wisdom. It's coming down to them like rays of sunshine. And they have a perception that other people don't, right? They have a, a higher intuition. They are in tune to God. You know, they've, they've, they've turned their radio channel to, you know, to, 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 the, to the God station, right? And it's coming in loud and clear. They're getting all the information they need. That's their special gift. That's their power is that connection to God. But God's saying, you know what? I'm turning off the switch, right? I'm, I'm turning off the tap. You're not getting any more of the good stuff. I'm going to make it so dark, you know, instead you're not going to know what the prophecy is. How can you prophesy if you don't have the wisdom or the words? So God's going to turn off the spigot. God's turning off the lights, uh, and they can't, they won't be able to do anything anymore. God's going to rob them of their power in the same way they are robbing other people of their power uh, and uh, of their means of, of sustenance. Because what good is a prophet if they don't have God's, you know, words in their mouths, right? It's just another dude yelling on a street corner. Uh, so, so he's condemning false prophets? prophets? He's condemning false prophets, uh, and he is um, basically saying he's going to turn the regular prophets, the ones who uh, are you know, claiming to be prophets, I should say, he's going to take away from them as well. So yeah, so it, it, it's a screed against false prophecy uh, and, and people who are, are fakers or who are illegitimate. Uh, and so, and then it's going to get to the point where they're going to, they're going to cover their mouths because they've got nothing, they have nothing to say. So they can't, you know, they can't say anything. Uh, they're, they're going to be completely struck dumb. But whereas those people are going to be in trouble, right, and those people aren't going to be able to uh, to prophesy. Linda, you want to read something? Sure. Oh, go ahead. Yep, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. But I, I am filled with strength by the spirit of the eternal and with such courage to declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sins. Hear this, you rulers of the house of Jacob, who oh. cheat the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all this, all that is straight, who build Zion with crime, Jerusalem with inequity. Very good. So, whereas those other prophets, those other fakers, right, what, where they're terrible, they're going to get the TV channel turned off on them. You know, God's going to flip the power uh, on them, make everything dark for them. Not Micah. Micah knows. Micah has the knowledge. Micah is, is going to be the one filled with God's uh, spirit and courage and is going to be able to speak the truth and give the true message that God isn't happy. The other prophets, the ones who are fakers, the ones who think they might know what God wants, the ones who are saying, hey, everything's great, everything's fine, and all this bad stuff is happening, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. You know, those people, God's going to you know, take care of, Micah is the one speaking the truth. Uh, Micah is the quote-unquote true prophet, you know, the one who is going to be giving them uh, maybe not a popular message, but the, the, but the message that is actually from God. Uh, and so then he's going to get into, again, another little diatribe here against those who are oppressing people, you know, and you'll see almost the reverse imagery, right, that we would normally have. So who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight. You know, those who are taking, you know, the, the truth and twisting it around, making it tying into knots, you know, all that other stuff. So that's not good. And who literally builds Zion, who builds Jerusalem with crime and with sin. Uh, that there's going to be, again, a day of judgment is coming and it ain't going to be pleasant. Uh, okay. Uh, Leah, you want to take this over here? Sure. Her... Rulers judge for gifts, her priests give rulings for a fee, and her prophets divine for pay. Yet they rely upon the eternal, saying, the eternal is in our midst. No calamity shall overtake us. 
Assuredly because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field and Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins and the Temple Mount a shrine in the woods. Okay, here's the hammer, right? He's breaking out. So he's detailing some of these sins that are happening. The rulers, you know, uh, are, are judging. They're being um, tempted by bribes. The priests, you know, are, are going to be in favor of you. If you give them a, a shekel, to give them some coin. Same with the prophets. All about buying justice, buying favor, you know, uh, and the powerful, the rich have that ability, the poor don't have it. Uh, and so it's inequitable. Uh, and then, and it, uh, unjust, obviously. Uh, and they say, even in the midst of doing this, uh, you know, oh, God's with us, it's fine. You know, God's in our midst, God's in Jerusalem, we're going to be fine because God's presence always dwells with us and we can't be hurt, we can't be harmed because we know God is, is here with us. But not so much, according to Micah, that Zion's going to be plowed over, Jerusalem's going to be ruins. Uh, and just like we were talking before about the idea of shrine, right? The Temple Mount, the holiest spot, right? You know, the, the, the location of the temple, that's just another shrine in the woods, if you don't act right. It's just another place uh, to worship uh, and, and create idolatry. It's no different uh, if you're not going to act well. So it's very powerful, very uh, harsh words from Micah. But since we only have a few minutes left, I think we should end with something a little more optimistic uh, than that, because now we're going to move uh, over to hope for a minute here. Tony, give us some hope. Mount of the Eternal's house shall stand firm above the mountains, and it shall tower over the hills. The people shall gaze on with joy, and the many nations shall go and shall say, Come, let us go up to the Mount of the Eternal, to the house of God of Jacob, that God may instruct us in God's way, and that we walk in God's path. For instruction shall come, from, come forth from Zion, the word of the Eternal from Jerusalem. Very nice. Thank you. So they get some good hope in the end here that it's going to be rough for a little while, right? Going to have some problems. Uh, that's still there. But in the end, we're going to have this hopeful moment where God's house is going to be established. Everyone's going to come and everyone's going to say, hey, let's go. Let's go up to, to the mountain of God. Let's all come together and worship together uh, that we may uh, walk in God's ways. This of liturgy is found uh, in prayer books. I mean, so the piece of prophecy, I should say, has become liturgy, and it is in prayer books, uh, you know, today. Uh, we don't have all of it in our prayer book, but we certainly have the last two lines in our prayer book. Uh, it's sung every Torah service. Ki mitzion teitzei Torah, udavar Adonai miyushalayim, for instructions will come forth from Zion, the word of God from Jerusalem. Uh, and so that part has made it certainly into our regular worship service, a very beloved uh, text uh, and one that we hear, you know, for, during our Torah service. Um, and so that's an, a nice place. Uh, we'll continue a little bit only because I want to get to the other famous quote here. So, you know, we, but we have a lot here. We have over here Micah, um, you know, God's going to judge, et cetera, et cetera, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not take up sword against nation. They shall never again know war. Lo yisagoy el goy cherev, lo yimladu od milcham ma. But every man is going to sit under his vine and fig tree uh, with none to disturb him, none to make them afraid. So we see again, Micah has some pretty important lines that we get here. Yeah. Uh, and if we keep going a little bit further down, uh, bah, 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 five. He talks a lot. He's got a lot to say. <laughs> All these prophets got a lot to say. Okay. And so here he has this. Um, so this is a, this is a part that's again very uh, you know, oft quoted. The la the last verse I'm going to read, not these first two, but the first two are important uh, for the setup, right? You know, you got to have the context of it where you have to imagine the people asking Micah, because he imagines this conversation, right, of, and something that we talk, I, I think, still today, right, what does God want from us? 
Like, how, how do we live a good life? What is it that God desires? And so he's imagining this conversation, this argumentation, uh, with, John, with verse 6, you'll see it. You know, so he imagines people saying, with what shall I approach the eternal? Now, how am I going to do homage, you know, to God on high? So what do I do? What, what does God want from me? Uh, and so shall I approach God with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Sacrifice is very important, remember, in Leviticus. Uh, and the idea of coming to the temple with these, um, these big kurim, these first fruits of these animals, you know, to sacrifice is seen as a, a very big mitzvah and a way of connecting with God. Year-old calves are expensive, you know, because these are, are young animals that have the potential to grow and be a lot more. So to sacrifice these calves, it's not nothing. It, it, it is a sacrifice, right? So is that what God wants? I should sacrifice these calves? No. no, is then, you know, the rhetorical response. Okay. Is this chapter six? Uh, chapter six, yeah, verse six through eight is what we're looking at now as, as we wrap up. Okay. So, so the next part, would God then be pleased? Forget the year old calves. So the year old calves didn't work. So would God be pleased with thousands, thousands of rams and myriads of streams of oil? If I give God this tremendous bounty, this unbelievable sacrifice of thousands of rams and this oil everywhere, the biggest barbecue this side of Texas, you know, is, is God going to be happy with me then? No. Again, the rhetorical answer, no. no. God's not happy. The next line, even a deeper cut. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body for my sins. The idea being, shall I even offer up my child in sacrifice as they did with Molech, with Chemosh, with other deities? You know, would we, does God want my children? You know, would that appease God, make God not angry, and, you know, and that God will be happy with us again? And of course, no, that's not what we're looking at. And so you imagine this conversation of, these people asking, well, what do I got to do? What do I got to do to make God happy? What does God want? And then, of course, the clincher comes with 6, uh, 8. God has told you, oh, man, what is good, what the eternal requires of you, only to do justice, to love goodness, and to walk modestly or walk humbly with your God. That's what God desires. It's not the ritual uh, sacrifices it's the ethical, it's how we treat uh, each other. And so I think that's a really nice place for us uh, to stop in our study. I think it's a nice hopeful note and I think a really good reminder to all of us uh, of what's important. Anyone have any questions? Well, it seems like the history repeats itself. So going fast forward 2,700 years, up until the hope section, it sounds like what's going on today in our country and other countries. One can imagine some of the prophets wouldn't be so thrilled with a lot of what they see. One can certainly imagine that. So history doesn't change. There's nothing new under the sun, as Solomon or at least Ecclesiastes reminds us, uh, that what has happened before will happen again. Thank you, Rabbi. My Thank you. Thank you all very much. We're going to take a 30 second pause uh, before we jump into our next thing. I vote you are welcome to. Uh, otherwise, we'll catch you next week for our next prophet. Who will be which? Who will be who? Uh, it depends on if I can find anything interesting with Nahum, because he's next chronologically. Uh, but Nahum is boring as sin, I think, so we'll have to sort of see. <laughs> if I can find Nahum interesting enough, we might do Nahum. If not, we'll find something more interesting to do. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Goodbye, you. everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Let's sing some face. Thank you. Okay, how do we turn it to these? We have to join again. No, you got to join again. If you you can stay on, you're on. Okay. Now you're in the hotel room. Uh, yeah, it's from The Shining. Hey. <laughs> hey. So, there is an interesting view. What is that? And that was Leah. <clears throat> Leah, you're upside down. Oh no, 
No, oh, it's I'm, Linda. I'm Karen. Karen. Hey. 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 Now, I'm, Karen. I'm Hi, Gary. Hey. 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 How are we doing? I'm switching from my phone to my computer is what I'm trying yeah. to do. It, it didn't like one tablet. It liked the other tablet. Oh, me. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, yeah, I can do that. Okay. It's live, live long and prosper. That's in yeah. So you don't shake hands. You give the as long as you stay in your own little corner. Yes, you you do Spock sign. Yeah, and I have <laughs> computers in the background. There we go. I only can do one hand. I can do on the. Oh, there it is, kinda. That's better. We still have that join Zoom again. I have to fix that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. My grandson. Can we fix it again? And I I don't know how to fix that. I, I, as the host, I can rename you, name you whatever I want. So, so I guess I'll have to call Isaac and ask him to do that for me on his end. Debbie Siegel, thank you. Okay. Was Micah the son of Delilah? Delilah, as in Samson and Delilah? Yes. No. That's what I read. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, like there might be a, there might be a Micah, another Micah, but I'll I'll double check it for you. But I, I hadn't heard that one, so. I just, we just saw the opera before we came down to New York, and I just read that he was the son. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we don't get that lineage. Uh, but that he wouldn't be Jewish if he was the son. Why wouldn't he be? Because Delilah apparently was not Jewish. Samson was, and she wasn't, is what I read. What? Yeah, we also have to remember matrilineal descent wasn't a thing at that time, so. Yeah, it is, so it's very strange. Actually, the descent comes a lot later. So whether or not, you know, you had a mother who was Jewish or not didn't matter much mm. uh, back Rabbi, then. That, that comes much later. Rabbi, do the Karaites, they still go by a father, don't they? I believe so. Yeah, rather than the way. Yeah, because yeah. They, cause they, they don't accept um, <laughs> Mishnaic and Talmudic tradition. Yeah. So, so that all they need, all they need is the Bible. So yes, I, I think that is accurate. Yes. Um, okay. Rabbi, I have a quickie Sorry. question. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. What What are the quote unquote ultra religious people saying about Corona? Um. Good question. From what I've seen, it's a mixed bag, uh, where you have some of them who um, are probably more descended from the Mitnagdim, you know, the, um, the ones who are a little bit more on the enlightened side of stuff, um, the Litvaks, you know, from Lithuania, uh, that are doing a little bit more in terms of prevention uh, than, you know, the, the other groups that are a, a little bit less science-based and a little bit less, you know, less willing uh, to make uh, sacrifices. But um, it, it's it's very tricky, and I I don't you know I understand where they're coming from. Certainly, I don't agree with it, uh, and it's dangerous. So, so how does the Satmar look at this whole thing? They'll they'll, they'll probably look at it uh, as we're going to do what we want, uh, and if God wants us to die, we'll die. If not, we'll be protected because uh, we're going to do mitzvot and we're going to do the right thing by God and God will protect us from Corona. And if we do get Corona, God will heal us from Corona. Should that be God's will? That's like the Jehovah's. Right yeah, Jehovah's. That, that would probably be a, uh, a, a succinct way of looking at it for them, yeah. I think the Satmars just recently had a very large funeral for one of their rabbis who yeah. passed away. And yeah. there, was, there was a big to-do about all of these people congregating. Yeah, and yeah, they tried to arrest got them. Very, uh, yeah, it got very ugly. Yeah, I just saw in the news help. that I'm sorry, I just saw in the news that the, some people, a couple came up and I don't know where they were from and they spit at the, so they were in Brooklyn. So which which uh, Hasidic it was, but it was a couple or that's Williamsburg people. usually. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it didn't say which Hasidic group, but I just saw it. Said, there's, so, there's so many of them, but I'm just saying that, that their theologies are close enough to each other, or it's a generalization, you know, but certainly it's going to be difficult with them uh, to have them maintain any kind of social distancing or whatever, because they're not going to believe that 
they're going to have any problems believe that God is going to protect them from it. And if God doesn't, then it's because they have sinned and they're going to, you know, uh, then deal with whatever they have. It's like, it's, about, it's like the ones who say, you know, you get, uh, you, know, you got cancer because your mezuzah wasn't affixed correctly. <laughs> you know, a which, which has happened enough times uh, in my experiences that uh, it's not a good thing. As I mentioned last time, some people could say that God's punishing the world because of all the bad things the humans are doing. And maybe the ultra-Orthodox said, we're doing the right thing, so God's going to save us or do whatever he does to us. Yeah, well, they're going to leave it up to God. You know, it's going to be God's will, you know, uh, whatever it is. And uh, I would think, again, that maybe we try to do things to protect ourselves uh and not when you leave it uh like that we have some sense of uh responsibility because i believe that god gave us free will and god gave us the ability to use our our thinking caps uh and that we should probably uh use that uh, when called upon and not just say hey you know it's fine uh so i worry i worry for that community you know and uh, I, I want them to be well and i want them not to spread things to other people you know either that, that, that's the problem. And yet, when the government, whatever it may be, comes in and tries to straighten things out, people lash out at them. So is that fair? Well, it, it, it's what I worry about because it's things like this that the government comes in uh, and, and busts their chops. Um, and, and then one worries, I, I worry, I'll put it this way, I worry on two fronts. I worry about the imagery that it evokes, because that imagery scares me. Mm -hmm. I worry about the message that it sends to other people, especially when statements are made casually, oh. that the Jews have to be better about this, that the Jews need to monitor themselves better. These like, very casual statements that um, are, again, evocative of anti-Semitism, and one can argue that, I don't think we can even argue it, I, I would clearly state that they can provoke anti-Semitism, uh, is, is my concern, right? You know, and so there's a lot of problems. It's, I, that's why I would prefer the ultra-Orthodox to not do it, because it doesn't benefit us in any way as a Jewish community. And then when you have uh, this further agitation, right, from the and, and the perception, it just, none of it, none of it ends well for us. What I'm trying to say, like none of it's good. Uh, it's not good for the people themselves who are, who are going to get sick. It's not for the good for the Jewish community that's going to get blamed by other uh, by other people for you know for making other people sick, uh, and it's not good for the uh, increase perhaps in anti-Semitism, which we don't need. We we got, we got enough of it already. Uh, but like any pandemic or any, I should say, bigger tragedy, whatever it is, somehow it finds its way to us. You know, there's always going to be a group of people that are going to find a way to blame the Jews. Uh, did, and did, I, you hear what, did you hear what happened in Lithuania today? No. Lithuania, no. One, one, of the, one of the large cities in Lithuania, the chief of police asked for a list of Jews by name, address, and telephone number. Oh, lovely. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So if this is like really scary stuff. Then, what, why, did he, why did he do that? What was his reason for asking for those? That he doesn't have to have a reason. Does he have to have a reason? No, you know, uh, it, but it makes it scary. Uh, right. Again, as if we weren't living already in scary times. You know, we, we don't need... It's like a list of the I just like, I don't I don't you know there's never any excuse for it obviously but I'm saying that I, I wish some of these communities would get with the program a little bit more because we don't need any more agenda than we already have uh, and I get this I get worried about the casual anti-semitism uh, that is sometimes you know just you know because again I think sometimes they just say things uh, the Jews this, the Jews that, and other times it's really terrible stuff, and it's inciting. So the ADL, you know, they, they slammed uh, de Blasio, you know, after his statement, and then, you know, he gave an apology, but by then, it's already in the water. You know, he's already <laughs> said it, 
you know, and, and, and I just don't want any incitement against the Jewish community or against any community, but against the Jewish community because some, you know, in our history that always get blamed more. And, uh, you know, if they're going to be policing ultra Orthodox funerals, I'd like them to be policing yacht parties and other things that are happening in other neighborhoods as well. People are congregating uh, in huge groups and there isn't police presence. All the protesters with the American flags and, you know, great America great again, you know, they've been condemned by the scientists, but uh, politically nobody saying, you know, well, they're, they're, they're wrong and they're anti-American because they're being not being safe. Well, it's, more, it's just a signage, you know, when, when you see the SWAT stickers and you see the, you know, the other sort of really unpleasant look. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to paint with a broad brush. I'm just saying that like when you, you see sometimes in these protests, some elements of, of society that are coming out that aren't the friendliest and aren't the nicest. And that's not everybody, you know, there are other people who are protesting for different reasons. But I, again, I, I get worried when I see anything that to me, indicates a, a raising in the level of anti-Semitism and bigotry. And these things do not always bring out the best in people, to put it lightly. Uh, you know, uh, there are some people who in moments of tragedy and struggle and strife, uh, again, I, I forgot the quote, I'm trying to remember it, but it's like, the quote was something like, like, these experiences don't make you who you are, they reveal who you are. Uh, and there are a lot of people who I think are being revealed in a not great way <laughs> right now. And we need to take note of it. We, we need to just keep our head on a swivel. <coughs> because these feelings that are there, they were there before, you know, but now they're just being exposed and they're being out there uh, more with the anti-Semitism. And that, that, to me, again, would raise a flag. Rabbi, yeah, so people don't change. No, uh, you know, I, I would say that there are people who just have a lot of hate, obviously, uh, you know, in, in their heart and a lot of bigotry. And then not that they need an excuse, but if they have one, it's all the worse. Yeah, well, it's a skunk starting to show his stripe. <laughs> yeah, well, again, I get, I get worried. I get worried when I see it because, again, it's a lot, a lot of the imagery we've seen before. It's traumatizing, it, it, uh, you know, it, it, for some people, certainly, and it raises a red flag for others. And I, I, I don't think it can be discounted. Uh, and so, again, the Satmars, you know, and the rest of them should do us all a favor <laughs> and sort of, you know, try to behave themselves a little more with these things, understanding that God wants pikuach nefesh, saving a life, you know, not putting yourselves in harm. Uh, perform the rituals. Well, we're all trying to do. We're all trying to perform our rituals and have a connection to Judaism. But let's do so uh, in, a, in a safe way. Um, and so that would be helpful on one hand. On the other hand, it would be nice to see us cracking down a little bit more on uh, anti-Semitism and really being very clear on all levels of society. It's not something to be tolerated, that we have to really be uh, forceful in our condemnation uh, of what we're seeing here. Uh, if you, um, it should worry us. I haven't heard anything from the fundamental evangelical Christians supporting the uh, Hasid in Brooklyn or wherever to have their funeral service and be together because they say this is right. This is what religion's all about. We can't be told what to do. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think they're running to support anybody. <laughs> it isn't them, but you know, yeah. But yeah, it, it, look. And to, to broaden it, it's going to be a struggle, right? I mean, we, we haven't gone through anything like this before. Uh, so how we reopen, how we return to normalcy, whatever that even looks like anymore, uh, you know, balancing out issues of religious freedom versus, you know, communal good. What does communal good even mean? Uh, it's different for, depending on who you ask. It's going to be, I mean, it's going to be very hard for faith traditions to navigate these waters uh, because I, I think that, you know, it's going to be difficult for a longer period than we are prepared to tolerate. I think as we're seeing already, we're prepared to tolerate this for a month. 
you know, ha after a month ends, we're not prepared to tolerate this anymore. And people want to get back to, to, to real life. Synagogues, churches, the beach, you know, they, they want to get back to real life. I just want a haircut. And a haircut. <laughs> the question is, Rabbi, at what cost? At what cost? You know, and I, I agree, and, and, and that's the struggle, and that's what I'm saying. It, it's going to play out, I think, and it's going to be really challenging uh, for communities uh, because there's going to be a lot of forces pushing on both sides. Uh, people who want things to go back to normal yesterday uh, and, and those who understand that this might be a longer haul for us to get to where we need to be, we might have to wander in the wilderness a little longer. Yeah. Uh, and people are, are, don't want to hear that message, I think, and so it depends on how they respond. And it worries me again. You know, it worries me personally. It worries you know me uh, as a, as a rabbi of a, you know at a synagogue, and it worries me as part of a greater Jewish community, and just as a citizen of uh, of Earth, <laughs> it worries me. It worries me on every possible level. So I want us to be safe and secure and healthy, and I want us to get there uh, in in a way that. Uh, you know, we're, we're all good. We're all, we're all taken care of. Interesting. It, it, you know, a lot of push on the vaccine, which takes a long, long time. But on top of that, we have a growing amount of people who are anti-vaccine. That's going to come up, said that these people are going to blame China, going to be killed, and they're against the vaccine. Yeah, well, I was saying it's, it's bringing out all elements at this point. If you got, if you, if you got a... A, a, a grudge, if you got an axe to grind, now is the time. Because you can blame anybody you want out, out there right now. Yeah, yeah, conspiracy theories are just exploding. Everywhere. It's everywhere. I, I spoke with someone today who has family in Germany, and the family's a, a doctor, and they're having the same thing going on in Europe. People, she, he said that there are people going to the public plazas and raising absolute hell. They want things open, so they're no different than us, really. The same, the same thing that you know, we got to open up. They don't care about anything. They don't like being locked up. You're taking our rights away, and and no thinking, no thinking, no looking towards scientific reasoning at all. It's just I want, I need, and I want it now. You know, it really reinforces the difference between a dictatorship and a democracy. Because yeah. in China, they are told what to do, and they do it, and there's no discussion, and their numbers are looking much better now than ours. We have freedom of speech, and sometimes that can be detrimental. Lots of pay. Hey. As you said, it's what cost, right? And so, and that's part of the cost. And that's just, uh, that's what I'm saying. It's very challenging to try to balance it all out, because I just... Um, I hear, you know, some of the of the arguments uh, about opening and whatever it is, and I, I listen to it, and, I, and you know, there are some very good points to be made. Sure, but I think uh, those people uh, are very simply saying that, you know, I don't know anybody that's sick. This is a whole. It's not going to bother us. It's a small amount of people. Let us go back to our work, and we'll take the risk. But we don't think the risk is very much. Yeah, that's exactly right. But all I know is that the um, you know, Jewish community uh, certainly still um, universally, you know, is, is being pretty conservative about uh, about next steps right now. Uh, you know, URJ conservative camps, you know, they they close for the summer. Um, you know, synagogues and uh, you know different uh, organizations are really coming and saying, look, you know, we're still going to be you know sheltering at home. We're not going to be congregating in big gatherings yet. Uh, the big test is going to be in September. That, that's going to be the big school. Thing. Getting kids to go to school. Oh, no, I, I meant oh, I the flu it. season. Oh, the flu season. Yeah. Finding safety for the kids to go to school. Yeah, so, so, so between school and the high holidays and between, you know, uh, maybe a second wave of this, you know, September is going to be, I think, a big yes. test. Yes. Uh, did you see on the news tonight there's one college? I I believe it's Caltech, but it's not opening in September. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, they're going to do online. You know, it's going to do online. Yeah, one of the northeastern schools said they were definitely going to go online in September, August, September, whenever school starts. 
it's going to be the, 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 the sort of breaking point, you know, where I think we're going to get a sense of what's going to happen in the fall. Uh, well, the problem with online is this with Big Brother is going to be controlling everything. Yeah. You know, we're going back to uh, 1984 and all that stuff. And see, the state of California is closing their schools next semester. Next semester. I think it's big Zoom. I think the, the Zoom people are making a lot of money off this. Uh, no, no. It's actually been pretty, pretty affordable. But I got to tell you, like, you know, doing all these Zoom things, you get a little Zoom fatigue uh, yeah, really. from yeah. all this virtually. You know what? They'll come up with something besides Zoom. They're going to have to because, as you say, people are getting tired of Zooming. So. Tired of Zooming. I'm working on one, and so is um, is it is um, not Amazon, Google, Google. They're yeah. both supposed to be out pretty soon. Because the reality is, is that I think for a lot of us, um, certainly who are doing these meetings, we had an assumption. You know, we made an assumption that this would be good for a month. It'd be good for a couple of months, maybe, if that. Uh, and while no one was thinking, oh, this will be wonderful and replace actual community, you know, it, it, it fills a need, you know, for a while. But if, if we're doing this for a year, which I'm not saying we will be, but I'm saying if we're doing this for a year, I can see it's getting a little exhausting already, much less, you know, having people do this for God knows how long. You know, uh, earlier you had Micah, and today you, Anthony Fauci, was sort of a Micah. You know, he, he he says, "Look, I'm not God. I I can't tell everything is perfect." Yeah, but he is cool. making a he's making a profiteering of, of a possible dilemma in the future. Well, it's more like he he's bringing the message that people don't want to hear. <laughs> you I, know, think I think that's the issue. That that's why I see him as sort of you know that that comparison in a way is no one wants to hear you know the bad news. They want him to come out and and, and give us good news. And he can't, in good conscience, do it. That's not how he sees it. You know, he, he's letting the science guide him, and all of his years of, uh, of of expertise and work in infectious disease. So he's going to tell you how he sees it. Now he's not infallible, as he himself mentioned today, but he's going to tell you, you know, what he believes and what he's learned. And he's not going to sugarcoat it or paint it in a certain way. Uh, at this point, he's going to give you the medical, his medical and scientific opinion. Well, I think everyone is looking for a magic answer, a magic cure, and it's not here. And it's, it's going to be here. quite some time before that comes comes to pass. Yeah, and I think that's part of the scariness of, of this, is that if we get to a point where we as a, as a community, not, I'm not talking about TBI, I'm talking about the, more the general community, say, we cannot do X, we can't do Y until a vaccine uh, is created, might be a while. I think that um, from a medical science point of view, that because of so much research in the last 50 years and development, the fact that you can start using antibodies and plasma and make a vaccine in days or weeks or months is something that you could say the good Lord gave us the opportunity to do. So we may have an advantage because the science may help us break through this. I hope it does. I hope it, uh, it happens a little bit quicker uh, than I feel some of the... <laughs> well, I, I think the first step would be if we would have a medication that could help deal with it, not yeah. cure it, but deal with it. Well, I think the antivirals look very, very hopeful. Right. The antiv They're antivirals severe. look very good. And the person that got plasma from somebody who previously had it and got better. So that's... Yeah, but they're not, they're not even sure of that, and nor are they sure how long the immunity with the plasma lasts. Well, they're not, they're not immune, there's any immunity. That hasn't even been determined yet. Well, th th there is some immunity, but they don't know the length of time of the lasting of that immunity. No, if somebody could get it a second time. Right. You know, yeah. it's, so it's just going to mutate. <laughs> mutate. So this is going to be a while. Uh, you know, it, it feels like uh, that's at least my read on it. Uh, is that for someone? You know, I just I feel like we as a society have to maybe get more used to the idea of this might be longer than we all want, as if it isn't too long already. Uh, but it might be longer than we want. 
uh, and we might have to be, be doing things differently than we normally would. We, uh, we may have to start uh, loving Zoom. We need to start <laughs> loving Zoom and uh, <laughs> might need to find other outlets, you know, uh, as well. Because you know, it just uh, it, it makes everything much different. The celebrated the seventy was a seventy fifth anniversary of the uh, the you know Nazis uh, surrendering, and if you look back to Pearl Harbor, do you think anybody who was thinking then had any idea that it would be over in five less than five years? Yeah, a lot of uncertainty, you know, in, in the world, and this is another one of those moments. It's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we faced uncertain moments before. And we survived. And we survived. We got there, you know, and so might not be tomorrow, might not be the day after, um, pretty assuredly not, uh, but eventually this thing will be in the rearview mirror uh, and God willing, we'll all be safe and healthy enough to celebrate when that happens. Start so, loving Zoom. Together. Start loving Zoom and, you know, if you want to, to order in some food, that's not a bad idea either. Yeah. I wonder everybody wants to get outside because the, the family thing is driving them nuts. <laughs> hey, hey, look, you know, I, I just moved here not even a, a, a year ago yet, you know, uh, got a, a gorgeous place to go and go see things. I want to go out and experience. You know what? The beach will still be there in, in a few more months, you know, so if I'm not going to take advantage of it now, I'll take advantage of it later. Uh, well, you've at least been to Disney World before they shut it down, so yeah, that's good. Yeah, I got to Disney, you know, you know, so, you know, things will still be there. We just got to make sure that we're all still here, you know, uh, and so as much as I want to go down to Clearwater Beach, you know, uh, grab uh, a little bite to eat, uh, maybe an adult beverage and get on the beach, you know, that can wait too. Um, the, other, the other thing that's been noted is that we have influenza A every year, killing 20 to 40,000 people, many of them who are elderly or sick, but nobody, you never hear anybody talking about that in any social conversation, and he sure. did. Yeah, but it didn't kill 40,000. It took him a year a time. We didn't have 80,000 in two months. Yeah. Uh, that's not insignificant. Trump brings that up about, well, we lost these people, you know, 40,000 people. But that's in a, a, a longer space of time. You know, yeah. we've got lost 82,000 as of today in two months. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think that's the, that's pretty significant. The reference to Vietnam when I was in the Air Force, you know, over ten years they lost fifty-five to sixty thousand, and we've done that in two and a half, three months. Oh my goodness gracious! Yeah, so again, God willing, you know, uh, we will work hard to be safe and to be healthy, and again, realize that the world's going to be different for a while, and that's scary. It's disconcerting. It's going to bring up all kinds of emotions for people, and I just, you know, that, that's valid. We can acknowledge those emotions, but still, again, affirm uh, the importance of doing everything that we can, right, uh, to be healthy and to not further uh, transmit this disease because... What's even scarier now with this, with this children's uh, so-called Kawasaki type of uh, autoimmune destruction, you know, yeah. Fifty cases that you know that's another big fear and it's affecting you know young children mostly uh, grade school age all i know is that when i said we had murder murder hornets too i was like oh come on now <laughs> we can't have murder hornets in addition to all this other stuff yeah did you read that oh my god i i, I read it and i, I actually read this thing you know, in one of the stories and i look at it it's like it's like out of a horror film i mean it's just you know but, but, you know, the, but you know, this thing with the Kawasaki, they're finding that it is happening within our hemisphere as opposed to in China. They said it's about, it, it seems to be the European, the white European groups of people. Mm -hmm. not, the, not Asia. Yeah. Uh, one, one more thing, put it on the list. I don't know, but seeing the babies, that was, that's, that was sad. That's so, so hard. So we're in the middle of, of the plagues, that's all. Yeah, well, that's, you know, I'm waiting for the hailstorms uh, that, that hit the ground and turn into fire. How about the dumb? You know, once that happens, then we got a bigger problem. 
I mean. And the blood? The blood, yeah. You know, so if all of a sudden uh, the Gulf of Mexico turns to blood, you know, maybe we get, maybe we do need to get back to synagogue and start praying a little more. <laughs> we'll yell and tell you to quick open up the temple doors. Open up the temple. We got to get in uh, at that point. Uh, frogs everywhere. Well, here we have lizards, I guess. We don't have frogs. We've got frogs already, so. Yeah, we've got frogs already. So I think it's, yeah, it'll be the blood, you know, maybe three days of darkness, then we'll have some problems. Oh, my goodness gracious. I'm going to put up a little pic of yeah, vote, you know, uh, you know, for us to take a look at. Um, and let's see, do we got it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. This is one of my favorite, uh, you know, a couple, of, actually, there are a couple of teachings here that I really like. Uh, and so let's take a look at 510. Uh, Gary, you want to give that a read? Sure. There are four types of character in human beings. One that says, mine is mine and yours is yours. This is a commonplace type, and some say this is a Sodom type of character. One that says, mine is yours and yours is mine, is an unlearned person, Amharetz. One that says, mine is yours and yours is yours, is a pious person. One that says, mine is mine and yours is mine, is a wicked person. <laughs> okay. My last one best. Yeah, like yeah. the last one best. <laughs> it's a nice little mix in the rabbi's perspective. The rabbis in Pirkei Avot in this section, I uh, like to sort of have this game of categorizing people, trying to think about personality types, you know, uh, and our values. And so they say, well, what if, you know, what's your view towards your possessions and other people's possessions, right? And so they say it's normal, right, for a person to say, well, What's mine is mine, and what's yours is yours. That's normal, as the people say. Though they mention that some say it's actually not good. It's a Sodom type of character, the idea that of somebody being not gracious, you know, and, and saying that, that mine is mine, you know, always, and yours is yours, and then we leave each other alone, right? We don't interact or deal with each other. We just say, hey, I got my stuff, you got your stuff. That's it, and there's separation there. Uh, but is again recognition that that's usually how people act in the world. And, you know, it makes sense to people. The second one is uh, is more silly. That uh, they say, one says mine is yours and yours is mine. Well, that makes no sense. You know, like it doesn't work in any context. So they call a person an amhaaretz, which means an ignoramus. Uh, so uh, that's like a common rabbinic insult. You know, if they want to insult somebody, they call them an amhaaretz, uh, which literally translates to like. A person of the land, you know, uh, sort of, you know, not a learned person, uh, and so since that's nonsensical, that's an unlearned person, you know. Uh, then one that says mine is yours and yours is yours, they have as pious. Might be other words for it too, uh, but pious is what they're going to use uh, for it. It's very generous, very sharing. And of course, the last one, mine is mine and yours is mine too. Uh, being, yeah, yeah, there you go. I love that. You know. So it's different ways of viewing the world, right? Uh, different, different prisms. Uh, so I, I like that as a teaching. Um, this one is similar in terms of, again, how they're trying to break down uh, different categories of people. So this is four types of temperaments. Uh, Karen, will you give that a read? Sure. There are four kinds of temperaments, easy to become angry and easy to be appeased. His gain disappears than his loss. Hard to become angry and hard to be appeased. His loss disappears in his gain. Hard to become angry and easy to be appeased. A pious person. <laughs> easy to become angry and hard to be appeased. A wicked person. Okay, and so they're breaking it down again for us. Uh, the last two are pretty uh, straightforward, right? Hard to become angry and easy to be appeased. That's going to be seen as the most, uh, you know, uh, the most laudable characteristic, you know, that you're pious, if it takes a, a lot to irritate you, uh, a lot to, to, to provoke you. When it does happen, it can be made better easily. Uh, the last one is going to be seen as the most negative, where it's easy, angry, and hard to be appeased. That's going to be seen as very negative, you know, where somebody looks at you the wrong way and it's like, now I have a new arch nemesis, you know, and uh, Certainly, uh, I've experienced that a few times, and I've experienced all of these actually a few times. Uh, I'm sure we all have on our journey. Uh, we just meet people who just, you know, 
anything becomes an insult and not only an insult, but an insult that can't be remedied. Uh, where you have other people who, um, on that first temperament, for example, you have some people who are hot-headed, right? Some people who get angry and provoked very easily. But when it happens, they can be mollified, you know, a, a nice gesture, whatever it is, and the anger subsides and it abates, you know, pretty quickly. So what the rabbis say here is that, well, it's not positive, you know, that they're getting angry so quickly, but it is nice at least that you can appease them and they can sort of get back to a calmer state. And so it sort of it cancels it, it, it each other out, right? They, they, they merge into each other, so you're back to zero sum again. And the same with uh, the second one, hard to become angry. So someone who never really gets angry, but when they do, they uh, hold on to that grudge forever. They're gonna be angry for, and you, when you wonder sometimes these people, it's like, how can you be so mad at this person or whatever? It's not like you, it's not in your character to be so angry. You never get angry. Oh, but this person really pushed my buttons and you know did this, whatever it is. And now they are, you know, I would cross the street when they when they come walking towards me. You know, and they're so angry and they can't be appeased. And so say it's the same thing. It's positive that they never become angry, but it's no, or they barely become angry, but it's negative. You know that when they do become angry, it becomes World War Three, uh, and so again, it, it, it goes in and it becomes again zero sum, as opposed to the last two, which are more clear cut, uh, where there's a, a, a positive, you know, being hard to uh, be angry, and a positive in that you are appeased uh, easily. That's good, and of course, the other way around, being uh, negative. You know, I remember that Ellie Wazell came to Eckerd College every year for many years and spoke here. And sometime he said, you know, they asked him his experience at Auschwitz, and he said, I will never forgive the Nazis ever as long as I live. Yeah, I think that's a circumstance certainly it's a little bit more uh, extreme, obviously. I think, uh, I don't think the rabbis are thinking here about fascism, uh, certainly. Um, uh, the, the, the Simon Wiesenthal book, you know, The Sunflower, is actually a really great read, I think, when it comes to that topic. Um, you know, the, uh, the book is about him being, um, I'm trying to remember the book itself now, uh, where he is with a patient, right, with someone who, who is dying, and it turns out that the person who is dying was uh, a former SS officer. And it's many years later, and he's old, and he's dying, and he asks, you know, Simon Wiesenthal for forgiveness, to, to, to give him absol you know, absolution almost for uh, what he did during his life as he's dying. Uh, and then that, the book is about forgiveness and sort of what the answer is. Uh, so it, it, it's not a bad book to read. Um, I, I think it's pretty good. Um, Elie Wiesel, you know, he was uh, actually a professor of mine. Uh, I went to Boston University and I took a, a theology class with him. Uh, and it was just fascinating. I mean, it was a small class. It was mostly grad students. There were a few undergrads who were allowed in, and I was one of them. I had to interview to get into his class. Uh, so I interviewed with his assistant, and they, they said I could I can attend because I was a theology, you know, uh, religious studies major. And so they allowed me to take the class with the uh, with the grad students. And I I still remember that class so vividly because I remember his his quiet and his gentle presence, uh, and how. You know, he was somebody who spoke literally with, you know, kings and presidents, right? Uh, and he was just so diminutive. He was a smaller guy, and he spoke very softly. And so you had to sort of lean in, even in that small room, you had to lean in a little bit to hear him. Uh, and then he would, like, tell these stories, which sound, you know, almost like someone's telling a joke. You know, hey, you know, I was on the plane with, you know... Uh, the, the the prime minister of Russia and you know whatever it is and you realize it's it's not a joke that's just his life you know that that he uh, that's the circles he travels in because he's such a revered and respected um, you know scholar and historian and ethicist you know and and, and moral conscience um, and so and it really and yet he and yet he preached forgiveness and yet he preached forgiveness you know, yes. you know no, I'm that, surprised at what you're saying Jan. No, no, he, no, he said that he doesn't believe in tolerance. 
he wants respect. And that, um, that I got from him and talking to him at Eckerd that listening, that he, he doesn't want to be tolerated as a Jew or a person. He wants to have respect. And that he, I don't know if from what he said that, you know, he'll ever forget what the, you know, forgive the Nazis, you know, no matter how old they get and when they die at 90 or something. You know, uh, he, he definitely wanted to bring people together is the whole thing. I think he had no patience for obviously totalitarianism and for uh, dictatorship and for uh, human cruelty. So I think that's, you know, where he was coming from, I think is the idea that he was very, uh, very intolerant of intolerance, as I heard a comedian once. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, where he was coming from, is that he just, he believed in, in the importance of being involved, the importance of being active and the importance of making sure that, you know, that hatred and oppression do not hold sway. You know, we have a moral obligation to, uh, to fight against it because we know, uh, again, the plight of the sufferer, he was there. He was, the, again, like, his loss still hurts in a way uh, because we need more voices like his. Uh, we, need, we need more of him. And just a reminder, you know, that just, you know, uh, there are just some people who, who, who's, who's light, even though he lived a very long life, you know, we, we need more of him around. I would, I would, that's my, my opinion, but I, I think that's, that's true. Need more voices. Okay. Sandy, you want to give us one right over here? There are four types. There are four types among those who frequent the study house, Beit Midrash. He who attends but does not practice, he receives a reward for attendance. He who practices but does not attend, he receives a reward for practice. He who attends and practices, he is a pious man. He who neither attends nor practice, he is a wicked man. Oh, again, yes. So they're breaking it down again for us. Uh, again, I, this one makes me chuckle in a way, I guess, uh, is why I like it is because it does speak to, I think, the Jewish condition in a lot of ways, uh, in terms of synagogue, congregational involvement. But I think uh, in, a, in a greater sense, it's about Jewish involvement uh, and engagement with one's faith tradition. So, you know, you can come to synagogue, so to speak, you can come to your Judaism uh, and sort of listen and whatever it is, but you don't practice it really. You, you might learn something, but you don't really go out and practice it so much. You know what? you get a reward for your effort. You, you at least go, right? You at least make an effort to be there. Maybe some will filter through, but you, you make an effort for showing up. Uh, the person who never shows up to anything, but he lives an ethical life, you know, and he lives a, a moral life and he lives, maybe he's doing the right things at home ritually, you know, so it's not great. He doesn't show up, but you know what? We give him some credit for doing the right thing. Then of course the ideal that you attend, you're part of the community, and you practice what you preach, you go out there, you're doing the right thing. This is a good person. You do neither, bah, not good. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, Three you strikes, you're out. Yeah, you gotta do something, right? Uh, a little judgy language, no, no doubt. Uh, but they're, they're, they're creating, again, that, that, um, that divide, you know, that split. They're categorizing, again, these different ways. Um, but I also look at, I had, I had a, a teacher of mine who, who said, you know what, everyone has their place in the, in the community, everyone does their thing, and hopefully everyone finds a way to contribute in some way. It might not be in the way that we might want them to uh, contribute uh, or be part of the community, but everyone has their own path, their own journey, and we all are Jewish and we all look out for each other, and we all are, are, again, are, are part of that community that takes all types. Like that story, I forgot if I've told this story, but I probably have. But um, I, I had a, a friend of mine who, who um, he was a rabbi and the synagogue needed, uh, you know, needed money. It was that time, you know, and so the rabbi synagogue, those have their lists, right, of the heavy hitters, like the ones who you can just call up uh, and they cut you a check without a problem. If, you're, if your synagogue is so blessed to have uh, people like that. Um, and so there's one guy, you know, who the rabbi would call in particular, if there was a thing you know, that was going on and they, and they needed money. 
this guy, you know, in his congregation would never come, you know, to synagogue uh, for Shabbat, he would never come to adult ed, doesn't, didn't come to the social events, came to nothing. He came twice a year, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, you know, that's what he came. But he would always be very generous financially with the synagogue. And so my friend tells the story, you know, he calls up the guy because the synagogue was in some financial straits, you know, and needed uh, some cash. So the, he calls up the guy, guy picks up the phone. Oh, you know, hi, uh, you know, Mr. Schwartz, you know, it, it's Rabbi so-and-so, uh, how you doing? And so the guy's like, Rabbi, I gotta tell you, I'm on the golf course. You don't care how I'm doing. Just tell me how much. <laughs> and the rabbi told him how much, after being a little flustered, told him how much. He said, you'll have it by Monday. I'm gonna go now, thanks. <laughs> that was it. And they had a six-figure check on his desk. So we need somebody like that. <laughs> you need to be able to call upon your big givers and just, you know, you, it's synagogues that have that, they're very lucky, uh, certainly, uh, to have that kind of generosity. Even if the attitude isn't always necessarily the best, the check still clears, <laughs> and, yeah, and you go to the next thing. Well, you know, sure, It would be nice if this guy went to Torah study once in a while, right, or whatever it is, but you take what you can get. <laughs> the uh, Catholic Church had indulgences. Indulgences. You, know, you could pay, you know, for your sins. But I remember in... Uh, in a Jewish Fed meeting in Orlando, they said there was an orange grower in Lakeland who came from Romania. And he was Jewish, but he'd never given a dime. So this fellow from Israel who was talking also was from Romania. So he made an appointment and they got a lot of money on him from him. And he said, well, how come he gave you a lot of money? He said, well, nobody spoke to me in Romania. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta know the language. Yeah. Got to do it the right way. Got to make the effort. Also true, by the way, it's also a very important fundraising idea. You got to go about things the right way. And you get a different answer based on your approach. Mm -hmm. That's certainly true. Uh, Bottom line, it's people to people. People to people. It's always relational, like anything else. It's, it's relational. Uh, figuring out, again, the right way of approaching people, talking to them, and just stewardship <laughs> is so important. That's where synagogues often have trouble, is stewardship. Uh, that's in my experience, at any rate. Uh, that it's true. You, you, might, you might get the, the, the check, you might get the donation, but then there's no follow up, there's no conversations afterwards, there's no proper, you know, thanks. There's no, there's a lot of things that can go wrong that can turn a, a positive thing into a negative thing fairly quickly. Uh, and just, you know, you have to, and again, you have to be responsible uh, with money as well. I think we all had that experience where we donate to a cause, but like we want to donate to a cause where we know uh, that the money is going to be used well. You know, but like we want to make sure that when we donate, it's actually going to go to the cause that we want it to go to, that we want to help the people we want to help, whatever it might be. We don't want it to be used for overhead or forever else that it might be used for. We want to make sure that our money is being uh, used properly. Um, so there's a lot that goes around with, with stewardship, but it's really important, I think. Um, for organizations to realize. It's not just about the ask, it's about the follow-up. Okay, let's see here. Marilyn, you wanna give us a read here? There are four types. Sure, there are four types among those who sit before the sages, a sponge, a funnel, a stra strainer, and a sieve. A sponge soaks up everything. A funnel takes in at one end and lets out at the other. A strainer, which lets out the wine and retains the leaves. A sieve, which lets out the coarse meal and retains the choice flour. Oh, thank you. Uh, I like this imagery as well, you know, four types uh, of learners. And you would think, you know, I think just from the beginning of it, that the sponge would be the most positive, right? Because, you know, we use that metaphor even today, that someone soaks up things like a sponge, right? They absorb all this information and all this knowledge. And so that is one way of looking at, uh, you know, one way of learning, so to speak. And that certainly, you know, can be viewed as positive, but actually the best thing is supposed to be uh, a sieve, which doesn't actually always have the best reputation, uh, but we'll get to it uh, at the end. The funnel, obviously easy, in one ear, out the other, right? And so what do you really learn? What are you really retaining? Not much. The strainer, uh, which lets out the good stuff, you know, the wine is going into the drain, and you're retaining the sediment, you're retaining the not so good stuff. 
So a strainer is the worst thing, actually, because only you're retaining is stuff that doesn't have any value. Uh, and the sieve is seen as positive, right? Because you're letting out the, the, the coarse stuff is, is, is getting out, but you're retaining the good. You're retaining the good teachings. You're retaining the good information uh, and not everything. So it, you know, it, there's a teaching from Rabbi Mayer, there it is, uh, about uh, this idea that he would learn from somebody uh, who uh, basically renounced, um, well, it's a, it's a question whether he renounced his Judaism or not. He was certainly viewed as a heretic uh, during his time that Rabbi Meir would learn from him. Uh, and then the rabbis would go to him and say, what are you doing? You can't learn from this guy. You know, we've already like excommunicated him. He's already chosen not to be a part of us. And he said, look, this guy's a great teacher of Torah. Uh, he has other views that are not great and so I, I don't listen to those but the actual Torah knowledge he has is really good and so he said it's like eating a pomegranate uh, I discard what I don't want I discard the the, the the peel the skin I discard all those other little layers in there but the seeds I take the seeds and I get rid of the rest is how I view him as a teacher and I, I've always liked that idea that you know we can learn from everybody uh, so an like, example that I give often enough uh, in my pluralistic way is that I don't agree with a lot of, you know, theology from the ultra-Orthodox or the Chabad or whatever it might be. With that said, you have a lot of people in, that, in those movements who are great teachers of Torah. And they have fantastic Jewish knowledge that they can transmit and ways of, sort of interpreting uh, text. And so I can learn with them. And I say, well, I'll take what I like, stuff that I agree with, stuff that increases my learning, and the rest of it, fat. I'll toss it out. That's why I'm not them. If I wanted to be that, I could be, but I don't agree with it, so I'm not. So, you know, I'll take the learning that, that they have that I can appreciate, the Torah knowledge or whatever it might be. Uh, and the other stuff, not for me. Someone else can handle it. Great. Um, and to me, I, I've, I've liked that model of, of um, cause I feel like we're always supposed to be learning from each other and everyone has something to teach. So I might not agree with somebody on 100% of what they uh, are teaching or where they're coming from, but it doesn't mean I can't learn from them. I can't learn something, you know, interesting uh, or insightful. Plenty of people, you know, uh, certainly in rabbinic Judaism that I've read their work and some of it I, I like and other parts, meh. Not what I want, not what I'm listening to today. Frankly, the Torah is like that. A lot of parts of the Torah, really good teachings, really good knowledge. Some of it, less so for today. You know, I had a professor of mine, uh, fortunately named Lenny Kravitz. Uh, so not the musician, but the professor of philosophy, uh, Lenny Kravitz. Uh, Dr. Kravitz would um, always talk about that idea, uh, is, is that, you know, you, you, you learn what you can you know, from some people and the rest of it, you toss. It's okay. You know, uh, so I, I think it's a, it's a good one. Okay. And I think the strainer and the sieve really are the same thing. My point exactly, Jan. I agree. <laughs> strainer you know, is for wet and the sieve is for dry, usually. You know, yeah. they, you're getting the wine, which is good, and you're getting, uh, you're letting out to get the wine, and you're having the choice flower that's not getting through, <laughs> there's both the same. Yeah. I think what they're saying, though, is that the wine is going down the drain, uh, in this case, as opposed to being retained and caught by something else. But yeah, but I, I understand the mechanics, you know, uh, are similar. Yeah. I think I taught a lot of those funnels. <laughs> a lot of those <laughs> Well, maybe they're not so funnily anymore. Maybe they're a little spongy now. <laughs> God willing, right? <laughs> okay. I use this uh, quote uh, sometimes uh, when it comes to, I think, a really important um, issue that we have today, uh, which is arguing uh, with civility uh, and trying to disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, so I really like this uh, this quote here. Uh, Sandy, are you still here? Yes, 
Oh, there you are, Sandy. Yeah. Sandy, Wait, you, want, you want to give me this well, one? Before she reads, I got to make a comment. Everybody's in color, but Sandy's in black and white what on mine. I don't know why that is. How come? I don't know. That's why I was going to ask you why you were in black and white. I thought you were well, going for like a film noir kind of look. That's it. Yeah. That's my film noir look. I am wearing black and white too. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Okay, every, that's okay. Every dispute that is for the sake of heaven will in the end endure. But one that is not for the sake of heaven will not endure, which is the controversy that is for the sake of heaven. Such was the controversy of Hillel and Shammai. And which is the controversy that is not for the sake of heaven? Such was the controversy of Korah and all his congregation. Okay, and so we have an idea of disputes, right? How, what does it mean to be in an argument? What does it mean to dispute something? And so the rabbis here are trying to teach that it's okay to have arguments. Frankly, like we have all this Jewish wisdom because of arguments, because we're all debating each other. Uh, and in the best case scenario, sharpening each other and bringing out, you know, better points, better perceptions, greater wisdom, right? And so the controversy is for the sake of heaven is one that, you know, creates more knowledge, more wisdom in the world. So Hillel and Shammai, right, the two rabbis, uh, the two teachers, right, that are very, that looked upon as almost like the prototypical sort of rabbis in a way. So they have numerous debates uh, in rabbinic literature, and 99% of the time Hillel wins. Uh, and, you know, so, so it's like Shammai says this, Hillel says this, we go with Hillel, you know, more often than not. So they say that, but you know what, that's positive, because even though that they uh, disagreed, they were both great teachers of Torah, right, and they wound up creating better Jewish law because they had each other to work off of as foils, you know, so they were arguing with each other, debating with each other, uh, and the schools continued to grow, and uh, it brought more knowledge into the world, and especially in the case of Hillel, right, the, uh, the, the teaching, right, was that both Hillel and Shammai, they both were right, sort of in their way. They both sort of spoke uh, and, and taught with authority in God's law. But Hillel's rulings get mentioned because Hillel is, frankly, nicer than Shammai. Uh, and Hillel shows Kavod by teaching Shammai's ideas to his students first before presenting his own. And Hillel comes with a greater sense of humility. So that's why Hillel's teachings get, uh, get used first and are seen as a, just a little bit better than Shammai's. So that's one way uh, of arguing, right, is that you're increasing knowledge and there's a lot of respect in, in the argument. But the one that isn't good is Korach, you know, in his congregation, Korach, uh, my bar mitzvah portion, incidentally enough, uh, Korach wanted to create a revolution uh, against Moses uh, because he was greedy, you know, and he wanted power, he wanted, you know, um, authority to be his uh, and not Moses. And so that debate was not for the sake of heaven. It wasn't to increase wisdom and knowledge and whatever into the world. It was selfish. It was self-motivated. Uh, and so that argument is not good. Not, not a good self-argumentation. Oh, my goodness. Nine o'clock already. Yeah. Can we pick this up again next week? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, because it's getting close to bedtime. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> at least God willing. Not in my house are, right now. These are all saying exactly the same thing, the fours, right? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, the, the, the fours are a pattern in this chapter. Right. Yeah, I skipped the first part because that was in tens, and that's a little lengthier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I figured fours was an easier bite uh, than uh, these are the ten things for this. These are the ten things for that. Oh, um, okay. Uh, and so uh, as we say goodbye for this one, uh, I want to finish this one. I, I, I like this phrase from Judah Ben Tema, uh, who said, "Be strong as a leopard, swift as an eagle, and fleet as a gazelle, and brave as a lion, uh, and uh, to do the will of God." You know, basically, the way I phrase it is, you know strong as a leopard, et cetera, et cetera, to do mitzvot, you know, to sort of when, when we're, we'll have an opportunity, do something good, something right for somebody else, uh, when the opportunity to confront uh, something negative in our world, we got to do it with courage, you know, with, with, with speed, uh, with um, nimbleness, you know, uh, and with 
again with courage. Uh, and so I, I think that that's a great lesson for us is that whenever we have an opportunity to do good in the world, we shouldn't be cowed. You know, we shouldn't be um, should be quiet, you know, about it. And we should go out there and, and with strength and energy and enthusiasm go out and make the world a better place. That's a little bit of parting Torah for tonight. <laughs> it's best to yeah. Thank you. Okay, it's my pleasure, everybody. Same Thank time, you. Uh, same place. Thank you. Thanks. Stay well. Good, Stay well. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you, night, everybody. <clears throat> and stay tuned. You know, there's, there's more coming up uh, down the pike. We're doing a lot of good planning over the past uh, couple weeks. So we're just. Uh, cool. I'm, I'm working on a speaker series idea. And mm. So we'll, just, we'll 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 see how that goes. But I'm trying to bring in some people uh, to do some good stuff. So a lot of good stuff going on. Everyone have a good night. You too, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Good, night. good night, all. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 Good